Good morning. Uh, you're listening to Business at Breakfast on HOSPO Live. My name is James Haken. I'm the co-founder of this initiative, HOSPO Live, and also the chief executive of Think Hospitality. Really pleased that you can uh, join us today. Absolutely thrilled to have our guest as uh, entrepreneur, investor, former dragon, uh, TV personality, Sarah Willingham. Welcome to the call, Sarah. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, great, thank you. Thanks for being with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Not sure what's happening to my video, but we'll bear with it. Can uh, you see mine? I can see yours, yeah. I'm so proud of my virtual background. I think uh, it actually looks like the view from your house though, doesn't it? It is, <laughs> it is, but it's it's still, it's a photograph that I took. I'm very pleased. Technically, I think this is amazing. It's, uh, it, it's a great start. <laughs> At least on your side, we can see you. So that's brilliant. So uh, thanks for joining. I can see your face, James. Where are you? I don't know. Literally, it was working in the test five minutes ago, and now the video is not working. So it's slightly obscure, but we'll get it fixed for next time. Uh, I even set up a, a cool little studio format behind me as well, because I didn't have a brilliant view of a beach. So <laughs> I'll have to send you on. There we go. So... Uh, <laughs> So thanks for joining and uh, the last couple of weeks have been pretty nuts and we've been on WhatsApp talking and discussing what's happening but uh, are you able just to give a little bit of an overview in terms of what the last few weeks have meant for you in terms of the whole coronavirus thing and dealing with that from the businesses you're involved in uh, and I don't want to stick on this for long but I think it's probably quite relevant. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, as I said to you a couple of days ago, I feel like I've lived five years of my life in the last um two and a half weeks really it was um three weeks this wednesday when i was i had my last day in london um and i went home that evening and my husband's danish so they were slightly ahead of us and my dad lives in france and both of them had sent me messages from oh there you are hello <laughs> both of them had sent me messages um to say Denmark was closing down and my dad looked like he was going into lockdown this weekend. This was about 10 o'clock at night and I then spent the next four, five hours um, on my laptop looking. I, I even ran the maths on a spreadsheet, uh, working out where we were on the curve and I felt sick to my stomach when I realized actually just how advanced we were and that in fact, closure for pretty much all of my businesses was going to be imminent so the following day that's Thursday Friday Saturday we we all closed on the Tuesday so this is kind of working the week before was speaking to all my boards was all the investors speaking to other people in the industry like you other people that I know and saying this is coming you know Monday Tuesday we've got to be ready for this and we've got to plan for because what my worst fear was that we would literally be shut down that night with no plan no idea what we were doing effectively not be allowed back in the sites so it was about trying to do it in an orderly fashion um i think i had more adrenaline in my system <laughs> for that week um than i've had for years years and years but we did get there, we did speak to the staff, we did make plans, we did try to get on top of it as much as was humanly possible. So, but on the Tuesday, as soon as the government made the announcement that people were to stay away, this is before we were closed, to stay away from our industry, we felt very strongly actually that there is, there's an element of social responsibility there and we shut, we shut everything knowing that it was coming anyway so you know another three or four days of trade actually from our perspective we were better off getting on top of it and encouraging people to to stay home um and then it was just waiting out what help we were going to get the, from the government i must admit i was very pessimistic i expected the worst i thought this was it you know we were likely to be shutting our businesses for three to six months and have very very little help and I have to say, um, I thought the Chancellor's speeches throughout this, what he says he's going to deliver, um, have been 
brilliant. I mean, to be able to furlough our staff on 80% of their salary means we have a chance of having a sol solvent businesses at the end of this. That was always our biggest fear. Um, the landlords, it's all still very much up in the air, as you well know. Um, some landlords are really not playing fair um, and are being, making it very, very difficult for their commercial tenants. Other landlords are being amazing. And we've got that mix from L in London Cocktail Club and in Tonkotsu, just as every other business has got that mix out there, where we've got some that are being fantastic and giving us a three month rent holiday and others that are saying, no, this is a contract. You've got to pay it. So we're working through that at the moment. But I my absolute... Just Sorry. This morning, just this morning in the press, I think there was a big article about how a number of people have already tried to put foreclosure statements and notices in, trying to beat the government to putting in the putting in the legislation. And you just think no. it's crazy, right? It's absolutely. It's it's not just crazy. It's it's actually disgraceful. I mean, the most important thing is that we have staff that are still employed at the end of this in a business that is still solvent there is and there's a limit to what we can do having closed our businesses if we could pay that rent we would pay the rent but the reason why the government has got behind us is because we can't so it is they've also helped out the landlords that's the point is that the chain continues so just like they have for residential landlords that landlords have been given mortgage holidays to be able to pass that on to their tenants so they don't have to pay the rent over the next 12 weeks so everybody's got to work together to help us out otherwise we're going to have a frightening number of insolvent businesses left at the end of this and therefore nobody will have a job it's very short-sighted on the landlord's part very. Through, of course. I, I mean, mean yeah good luck trying you, to fill that space <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. they can kick us out and then who's going to take a you know a basement site in soho in the forthcoming months it's just not going to happen so the best thing for the landlords is that they help those businesses to remain solvent that they can pay their rent when they still open whenever it might be late summer autumn whenever that is so yeah it's been I think business-wise, by far the toughest two weeks, certainly of my life, and I'm sure I'm not alone in, in saying that. It's been very, very difficult. And now it's about how good are these loans? How quickly can we get them? We've got all our loan applications are in, um, and we just have to hope that that money comes as, as quickly as possible so that we can get on with paying the suppliers that need the money, that we can actually, again, start to look to the future and say, okay, this is what it looks like when we reopen. And have you found that banks have been helpful with that? We've been hearing from some players in the sector that they've just been told not to apply because there's no point. Not so we, we had that very difficult personal guarantee conversation that I think a lot of people had with some of the banks. And um, we said, absolutely ridiculous. You know, this is 80% guaranteed by the government. There is no way that these the banks should be able to have their cake and eat it. We, as a, the government taxpayers, have bailed them out. It is their the government are offering them help to be able to help us. That is the root of help. We need to be able to turn to them and rely on them. So I think I, I think it's disgusting that they're asking for um, for personal guarantees from people at a time like this. A number so, of them have done a U-turn over the weekend, I see. Yes, right. exactly. And and actually, our bank has come back and said, fine for personal guarantees, we're reviewing your loan application. We don't have the response yet, but let's let's wait and see. Ask me again in a week. But yeah, yeah, everything crossed. Absolutely. I think the uh, I, I don't want to hang and dwell too much on the whole coronavirus thing, frankly, although the reason we set this up was about engaging teams and people because of it. We want to make it as positive and motivational as possible. So let's rewind, if that's OK. Uh, let's rewind to uh, from all the reading and knowing you and having chatted with you. You start as an executive or you're an executive in restaurant businesses and you were managing sites and that whole piece. Can you just talk through that journey of kind of up through hospitality and then your your kind of conversion to an entrepreneur is that okay yeah yeah of course it's almost was there life before the last two weeks <laughs> it all see i'm, I'm worrying wondering 
what it's going to look like when, it, when we come out the other end and somebody asks that question retrospectively. So um, I've always loved hospitality. It's um, since it was my first job when I was 13, I worked in a cafe in Stoke, loved it because I was able to take the iced buns home with me at night time in the little cafe because uh, for my family and also I was given tips which you know a couple of quid in a day when you're 13 years old actually is a lot of money so I've always always worked in hospitality um, then fast forward what ended up studying business at university loved it really really enjoyed it and actually then became quite fascinated with the business side of restaurants rather than um, having my own, you know, one restaurant, I actually really enjoyed the way that the chains operated. Worked in, uh, worked at Planet Hollywood. I promise anybody who's watching who's under the age of 45 that Planet Hollywood was once cool. Promise. Um, and worked at Planet Hollywood. That was great. Opened restaurants in Europe, really enjoyed it. And then went on to, um, Pizza Express. It was quite obvious that the Planet Hollywood business model wasn't really expandable uh, at the time. It was they were spending so much money on the sites that even in mid twenties, I was like, "This doesn't really compute." You're spending. I so remember much my first experience at Planet Hollywood was in Cancun in Mexico, and it was like the coolest thing to do when you were a teenage kid. <laughs> there you go. You see, how old are you though? I'm thirty three. Oh, so you see, it was even cool then. That's 20 brilliant. Years, 20 yeah, years yeah. ago, I think it was 13 when I went. So. Yeah. <laughs> did you get the jacket? Uh, no I jacket. Thought, no, I did I buy a whole load of merch though, so. I reckon that jacket could become cool again, actually, one day. <laughs> no. Um, anyway, yeah, so, and I loved the international side of the business at this, at this time. So I looked around and thought, which high street chains could expand abroad and I loved Pret-a-Manger and Pizza Express this is 20 years ago contacted them both and said please let me set up your international department um Pret-a-Manger were I mean literally were like who on earth are you phone down but Pizza Express said actually we're in the middle of talking about this come in and then I ended up looking after their international development which was great um Loved it, absolutely loved it, was really happy. And at this point, I had no thoughts or desires that I was going to become an entrepreneur. It wasn't something that my whole life I'd said, oh, I must become an entrepreneur. I was actually loved the industry. I was continuing to learn. Um, and Pizza Express at the time really were the benchmark in sort of how to roll out a, a restaurant business. Um, it became quite obvious that international expansion was not core business. And I went to the board and said to them, you don't really want to expand abroad. You know, I'm actually spending half my time shutting places down uh, that we've already opened. So I think it's time for me to move on. And they said, well, hang on. Why don't you come and work for us, the board, and do sort of strategic projects, as it's called. I remember my dad saying to me, don't ever do a job that says strategic projects. You're the first to get made redundant. But, um, <laughs> sitting, sitting running a strategy consultancy at this point <laughs> I assure you that's right <laughs> I shall tell him he'll be proud <laughs> anyway um so I I then went to work for the board and I actually shared an office with David Page from oh, wow. um who's now doing Frank and Manka um and a guy called John Metcalf who was the managing director at the time and it meant that every single day I was sort of exposed to their thinking and I shared that office with them for about 18 months. And at the time I was like a sponge. I asked so many questions to the point where in the end I was like, I really understand what you do. Um, we were floated at the time and David Page was very, very good at explaining how our how we were creating value within up for the shareholders and that was a different a completely different angle that I'd never looked at before or never really understood from restaurants so when you're looking at well if we have a p ratio of 30 for every pound that we make every time we open a site that's worth 30 times on the stock market that concept I had never considered before. So when I was able to sit listening to him and watching him choose sites, and I would look at it and think, God, but that's a lot of money for a site. And 
Oxford, he would then explain to me how the value was created. And so by the end of it, I thought, God, I, I actually really, really get this. Um, I was getting towards my late 20s at this time. And actually, for very personal reasons, I knew that I wanted to have a family. I wanted to have lots of kids. I've got four kids. I wanted to have lots of kids. And I didn't really want to be, I didn't want somebody else governing my diary that I was kind of forced to get up on a Monday morning and do what somebody else was telling me to do. And that was the point at which I thought, well, I'm probably going to have to do it for myself then. It, it, it's the only way. So again, it wasn't this, you know, I didn't grow from 14. I haven't always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was very, very much led down the path because I need, I wanted to change my lifestyle and I wanted some flexibility. So that's when I went to the board and said, I really want to do to Indian food what we've done to pizzas, create the first chain, the largest chain. And they said, no, you're barking mad. We do pizzas. So um, I left, did an MBA, and during that time, raised the money, um, found the Bombay Bicycle Club, and long story short, managed to buy it. I actually ended up getting the backing from David and Paul when they had Clapham House Group, because they were also interested in buying it. Much longer story. So that was my kind of move into becoming um, an, an entrepreneur, and loved it. Was brilliant then very quickly realized that was going to be really difficult with lots of children. So it's, I, you know, it's, I, I'd gone down this path because I wanted to have the flexibility of having children and then realized that suddenly I'd got, you know, 250 staff and was rapid. I was had children one a year for four years and that it didn't really work together. So that was interesting. That was my move into becoming more of an investor, so a minority shareholder, where the businesses, I wanted to have it be, and I never wanted to stop work. I wanted to be in this world. It was my world. I loved it. Um, but I didn't want 250 people reliant on me getting up in the morning. So if one of my kids was ill, I could actually be a mom to them if I, if I needed to be. And that was very difficult running the business. It was a shoestring business. I, it was 18 hour days, really, really tough business to run. So I sold the business successfully three years after I bought it. Um, and then I said, right, I'm now not going to run anything again. Now I'm going to work with teams who are, who have got the ability to be able to run these businesses. So I can still influence, I can still help. And I still, I can invest some of the money that I'd made from the sale of Bombay Bicycle Club, and then I can still go on this journey that I love so much. So that was kind of the, the switch. And then actually I found that it's not just hospitality that I love, it's also a lot of consumer facing businesses. So that's kind of how I then moved into investing in other consumer facing businesses. And then of course, Dragon's Den, and here I am with, I think I've got 11 investments now. That's amazing. And we'll come back to the whole Dragon's Den thing. So everyone wants to hear that. But you, you've touched on the whole being a mum and working with four kids. And I know that you're when we talked pre this, you were quite keen to try and get that message out. I mean, from what you said there, it it's it's clearly a big ask. But do you think I mean, one of the challenges we see within the restaurant sector is that I think I hear all the time that a lot of a lot of women say they can't get into senior jobs because of a lot of the challenges you've just talked about. Do you think that do you think there is a way to do it? Uh, what's your view on this? So I I'm a very strong believer that you can't fight nature. So nature is always, always going to win. And if a woman wants to be a mom you have to allow that path because if if you try to fight it as a business you will lose so it's about trying to find a way that suits the individual and I believe that big businesses can do that so if it suit if a if somebody really wants to do the school drop-off for example, or the school pickup, allowing that to happen as much as possible. So allowing as much flexibility. And it's about talking to the individual and saying, what really matters to you? There are other people who, um, men or women, that actually don't want that. You know, they want to be Monday to Friday, very, 
very career focused, sometimes even away from home. And then when they're when at the weekend, they just want to be all in with the family or it might be Monday, Tuesday. I want to be all in with the family, whatever that might be. And I think it's about talking to the individual and allowing that to happen where it goes wrong is where a structure is forced upon an individual where they feel every day that they're fighting. And that's when ultimately nature will win and that person will leave and try and find something else and they will be, they won't be productive. So it is, I think it's about where possible, certainly for senior, man, for senior management, it's about talking to the man or the woman, it doesn't matter who it is, but for mums, we actually do physically go through a birth you know, we, we carry a baby and then physically give birth to a baby. So there is a natural need, sometimes for a very short period of time, sometimes for a longer period of time, it's very individual, where actually we want to be a mom. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, I think that that resonates a lot with with people. I think it's interesting. I was chatting with a friend a few weeks ago who was an ops director at a pub company and uh, she went off on maternity leave, came back and was uh, was all but told by uh, the CEO. Well, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to come back in this ops director role because you you, you simply can't do it. And uh, she was like, actually, I, I think that's wrong. I think that the challenge is that the way that everyone's done the ops director role up till now has been a particular way. And I think that I can do it in a different way and that will still be effective and it will still allow me to do what I need to do. She proved them, proved them right categorically and did an amazing job and went off, off and uh, took an MD job elsewhere but I think it was quite quite an incredible story and I think there are amazing examples in the sector where people are doing that and as you yeah. say I think from, it, it's about flexibility and about realizing that actually there are different ways of working just because something's been done one way forever it doesn't mean it's the only way. Yeah and I think it's about listening to the person on the receiving end of that and saying you know when they say this is how I can operate and I know I can do a good job. Listen to them because I know if you allow, um, certainly from my experience, when I've hired women into very senior positions that have had children and wanted to have children, um, when I've allowed them to be that mom, to be that person they've wanted to be, they've been some of the best hires of my life because I've allowed them to flourish not only in their career, but also in their home life. And that I think that's what's so important. I think actually there's a whole link between people being self-actualized or fully embracing of themselves and in love with what they're doing, both at home and work, that means something, right? If that's the way that that person is, uh, brings that to fruition and actually what you could end up with and I found this time and time again with uh, with hiring mums is that actually they work bloody hard continually uh, and often much harder than other people around them to prove that they're doing it and I, they shouldn't have to do that but I think there's that drive and there is that degree of happiness that I think means that uh, it, it, it can work for sure. But yeah and it also, it's, it's also by allowing people to be to work in their way, you give them a security that allows people to flourish. I think when you're trying to fight nature, it naturally makes people feel very insecure. And I think insecurity is one of the worst traits you can see in a business when you've got, you know, management sort of divide and conquer management where they're trying to make people feel insecure and, and have fear. Actually, they're the worst, most destructive team environments but when you see people who are secure in their job and feel comfortable they're and feel confident they're therefore allowed to flourish and that's when you start to see the most productive teams absolutely i think some really really positive positive messages there so thank you the uh let's pick back up so you became uh you're fundamentally an investor and you're on a bo on multiple boards and how how did dragon's den and the the TV career come to fruition? What, what happened? So actually, my my first TV was um, a show called The Restaurant. I don't know if you oh, remember. Raymond Long, Raymond right? Long, remember, yeah, yeah. who's a very, very good friend now. Um, and that was really random. I mean, I had the Bombay Bicycle Club at the time. And Bombay Bicycle Club is BBC, like Bombay Bicycle Club. And I had this post-it note that was put on my desk three days in the trot three days on the trot saying somebody from BBC has called. And I kept thinking, 
it's one of our sites. And I couldn't, that couldn't make the number work, couldn't get through, didn't think anything of it. And when they finally got through to, when I, and I phoned them, I thought, oh God, they want to come and film in one of our kitchens. You know, I'd not long bought the business and it's like, oh no. And they said, would you, you know, could you come in for a screen test? I was like, what? I know, I mean, I'd never done anything. This is what, 13 years ago now. Um, and I thought, well, brilliant. I'll go, it was TV center. I'll go in and see the Blue Peter Garden, nothing to lose, brilliant. And then I ended up doing three series of that that I loved. I mean, really, really enjoyed it. And I'm still such good friends with so many people that were on that show um, that have actually gone on to have very successful restaurant businesses, which is brilliant to see. So then Dragons came again, very, very left field. I just got a phone call. Could I come in for a screen test? And they were interviewing you know, nearly, they, they were looking for another woman and they had interviewed a lot of women. And I thought there's not, I mean, there's not a chance. There's like, you know, nearly a hundred women screen testing for this, but great. I can meet Deborah Meaden on the screen test. Love her. She's so brilliant. So off I went. Your favorite, favorite other dragon. Oh, I wouldn't, couldn't possibly say, <laughs> couldn't possibly say. I do love her to bits. Um, but yeah, so I went along for the screen test and then it all spiraled very, very quickly. It was supposed to be, somebody else was supposed to be the, the dragon and very, um, a very last minute, I think she had a lot of problems with her business. So this was a very short, this was like, three weeks, two or three weeks before we were supposed to start filming. Um, I then get a message, long story short, get a message to say, would you like to be our next dragon? And I just, I mean, I, I hadn't even, I thought, what on earth does this really mean? And I think I was as nervous as the contestants. I mean, really was. I sat on that chair thinking, oh my God. And the first but day- Putting on that steely face, pretending that you're not- uh, I was the nice one, James. <laughs> you must have seen it. I was the one who smiled, <laughs> I promise. And it's I walked in- just promo and I... shots that you've got the steely face in, right? Honestly, that photo that you used for this to say that we were doing this, it's like, that's from the first series. My a big helmet head, with of my enormous hair and I look so serious and so harsh anyway and not at all airbrushed not no, at not all, all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway that was such a great experience I absolutely loved it and again met some phenomenal entrepreneurs met, loved the dragons but met some great entrepreneurs had some brilliant investments from it I mean craft gin club which is probably my most successful ever investment um, came out of the den. And there's pretty much not a day goes by that I don't either communicate or speak to those guys. Uh, we're very heavily involved in the business and I, I love it and it's doing extremely well. So um, I've only got really good stuff to say about my experience on Dragons. I was very, very lucky to have done it. No, that's incredible. And I think that, uh... Picking up on that, it's interesting that a lot of investors you meet pick things up and are trying to flick them on after three or three to five years. It's interesting. I was looking through your portfolio and a number of them you've been involved with for a long time now. And what's the what's your thought process there as an investor? I think that a business has a natural cycle and people people running those businesses have natural cycles. So uh, um, for example, one of my uh, den investments, Sublime Science, the owner of Sublime Science, within a couple of years of investing, had really, really had enough. He was just ready to, he, he was finding it difficult to kind of manage, I guess, the stress of running the business and the staff. He still wanted to be involved. There was aspects of it that he loved, but he was ready to move on. And that's when you have to take action then at a time like that. And so we sold it um, successfully. He's very happy. He still works with the business. Um, London Cocktail Club is interesting because actually that's almost 10 years now. And we've, we've progressed during that time. So we've hired an MD. We have formalized ourselves. We've kind of done, we've almost done two stages of the business with the same team. 
Mm -hmm. And now it is actually going into another stage now. So now we would have to restructure again. So we would now have to either sell or do it ourselves because we're at that point where we've sort of got 11, 12 sites. Really, you need to take it to 25 now, a bit like the sort of tonkotsu. I came in at 11 and we, we're taking it to 25. So it is a different structure. And th these businesses have natural life cycles. And also our capability is limited. I always think in restaurants there are there are the naught to three or four people there are the three to sort of 12 15 and then there are 15 onwards i'm the three to kind of 12 15 naturally or up to about 25 i'm not i'm terrible at the naught to three you give me a blank room i i i, I just stand and stare at it i would not know what to do and, uh, but I'm very good at walking into somewhere and going, wow, there could be 20 of these. This is amazing. And, and I know exactly how to do it. And then after about 20, 25, I don't really want to be the person to take it to 300. It's not how my brain operates. So it's about it understanding. A bit of a corporate at that point, right? Exactly. And it's understanding the skill set of the people around the table and the natural life cycle of the business. So what we did with, with London Cocktail Club is kind of do two cycles. So mm -hmm. that's why we've been in it for so long. And actually, we may end up doing the next cycle ourselves, which is probably another five years, if you see what I mean. So I think it's, you, could, you should never go into a business thinking, right, I'm going to flip it in three years' time, because who knows what the macro environment looks like. I mean, we've had Brexit for the last two years, and now we've got coronavirus. I mean, just as I mean, businesses were starting to turn around. Right now, right? It's re exactly. So you've got to be able to be flexible and just make sure as entrepreneurs that you surround yourself with great people that have done that next stage that can help and guide you there if you do need to do it yourself. I think that's the key is be aware that your skill set might be the naught to three. So don't struggle through the three to 15 on your, on your own. Make sure you've got really good people around you that can help guide you on that. I think there's something really positive in that whole piece of do what you're you know you're good at and get other people to do other bits uh, i i discuss with the entrepreneurs constantly i'm like look you're not good at the paperwork you're <laughs> not good at this business stuff let us bring someone in that does that take a founder role take a role looking after the food looking after the drink whatever is you're passionate about and that's okay yeah exactly and i think there's a strength in acknowledging the things that you can't do there's a real strength in that and a real security in that to be able to say, actually, that's I don't that's not my skill set. So I'm not going to try and guide you on that. However, I do know somebody that really can help in that area. Let's speak to them because I trust their opinion more than I trust my own on this. And I think as we get more experienced and get uh, and get older, you, just to be able to say, I'm not good at that. It's not what I'm. I, I'm not. I shouldn't be the person to comment on that. So let's find somebody who's better at it. No, it's, uh, it's, it's really great advice. And there's been so much good advice. I'm very aware that we're five minutes over already. So thank you so much for your time, Sarah. It's been oh, incredible. Thanks. Thank you for having me, James. I've loved it. And thank you for doing what you're doing. It's a great thing. Really great right. thing. The more people we can get it out to, the better. And thank you for sharing on social and all of that stuff too. You've been incredible. And uh, to anyone else watching, next up is Mark McCulloch at half past 10, who's doing local marketing 101. Another person that's based down in your part of the woods, Sarah, he's Brighton based as well. Uh, so we may well see a very similar view in 25 minutes. So thank oh, you so much, Sarah. Brilliant. Thanks for listening. Take Cheers, care. Bye. Bye.